Hey everyone, Brian Zane here with another classic pay-per-view review as nominated by my Patreon backers. This week we're going to the land of extreme for the last hurrah of ECW as we knew it at the time, Guilty as Charged 2001, January 7th at the Hammerstein Ballroom in New York City. This show is nominated by Jeffrey Pridemore over on Patreon. Jeffrey, thanks so much for nominating this show. Yes, this is the final pay-per-view ever of the original ECW, but by no means do they treat it as such. This was no, oh, let's look back at all the fond memories, one last hurrah, gang, we're going to go out and blaze of glory. None of that, because as far as everyone knew, even though the writing was on the wall, it was business as usual in ECW. And that's important. Note that the writing is on the wall, because at this point, ECW had been without TV for about three months. They were taken off of TNN about three months before this, after Paul Heyman challenged TNN to take him off the air, and then they called his bluff. So yeah, there's been no TV, there's been no touring, so really all of their storyline advancement, all of their shows have basically been relying on pay-per-views. So yeah, kind of a shaky situation, and I'll get into what happens more, the downfall of ECW at the end of this review. Interesting, worth noting, uh, at least this was mentioned on Wikipedia in the in the write-up for this show, Scott Hall was advertised originally to be on this show, but then uh, they withdrew advertising about that, so who really knows what happened. And speaking of the extreme stuff, uh, if you notice this little red mark on my finger, this is not blood. I'm not uh, gigging for this show on ECW. I just spilled a little bit of printer's ink when I was changing cartridges today. That's why I've got a red tip on my finger. The show begins with the longest hype package of all time, or at least it feels that way. It's just five minutes of non-stop like highlight reel uh, with no dialogue, no narration, no text, nothing, nothing contextual about it or anything. Apparently in the original broadcast, the original version of the show, the song that is playing underneath all this is Renegades of Funk by Rage Against the Machine. The idea that Rage would license any of their music out to me is laughable, but the thing is of course it's the network version I'm watching. So you get this generic music underneath that is not the last time you'll be hearing me complain about the network dubbing on this show. It is pretty damn persistent. 2,500 people packed the Hammerstein Ballroom as the show officially opens with Joey Styles and Joel Gertner in the ring. And I think that Gertner alone is why this video on the network gets the TV MA rating. Another pay-per-view here in New York City. And with her face on my nuts, even that girl would look pretty. Gertner introduces Joey Matthews and Christian York to the ring. It's crazy to think that Matthews, who of course would go on to become Joey Mercury, crazy to think that he was part of the original ECW at the very end. He was very young when he got in the business and got his first break in ECW. It's very similar to me when AJ Styles would wrestle for WCW at the tail end of that company's existence or when it was about to die. Joey Mercury in ECW is very much the same way. As they're making their way out to the ring, DeBaldi's jump the two of them and beat them up a lot and then as that's happening uh, Joel Gertner who I believe was managing these two at the time tries to step up and, and defend them but he gets beaten up as well. Cyrus the former network representative of course that's Don Callis today but when he first debuted for ECW Cyrus the virus was representing TNN you know in kayfabe and everything so he was a network guy but with no network deal there was what was the justification for keeping him on he, he had done his job the network won essentially so he was doing color commentary uh, at this point in time as well as in this show. He shows up alongside Jerry Lynn. Uh, Cyrus has paid off to Baldies to do their dirty work and all of a sudden, like, wait a minute, are we having a match now? Because Cyrus gets in the corner on the apron and then Jerry Lynn hits uh, Matthews with the cradle pile driver, tags in Cyrus who just quickly pins Matthews and just as this is happening, Joey Styles' mic finally turns on just to call the pinfall. So this was a match apparently. There was a crooked referee there was with Cyrus and Jerry Lynn, so yeah, okay, well, this is a match I give it one half star because it was not much of a match. Uh, and then the music plays and then you can't make out what the audience is doing because this is the, the music and the network dubbing is going to be a constant issue with this show because when they play the generic music over the licensed music that they had in the original ECW, they also mask the original crowd noise. They can't get the original crowd noise because it mixes too much with the actual music. So you get this kind of like cheaply added uh, crowd noise patched in and you just it doesn't capture the authentic sound of what those reactions were like. You would think that within the massive video library that WWE possesses, they'd be able to splice in some kind of similar crowd reaction of booing or cheering or something to match what's going on. But when they play that generic music, you just lose all of that uh, crowd emotion and reaction. This happens pretty much like the whole show on the network. Basically, if you want to get the real experience of an ECW show, the best thing you can do is try and find the original VHS or DVD. Do not watch the network for that because you will miss out on a lot of the experience. It is very frustrating, though I tried to not let that affect 
my experience of watching it for the purpose of this review. Matthews is bleeding profusely on the outside of the ring as Cyrus gives the Baldy some cigars. Lynn cutting a promo saying he's no longer a jobber. It's his time now. He's the whole fucking show and he demands to be in the main event exclusively from here on out in ECW. Well, you'll get that wish, uh, but only once, unfortunately. A big RVD chant in the crowd and Lynn says, RVD's not coming. He's not the big surprise. And obviously, since they're telegraphing that he's not the surprise, obviously he will be showing up. But yes, RVD was kind of not really part of the ECW scene for the last several months because he wasn't getting paid. That is a common occurrence you have probably heard about a lot in the tail end of ECW. So RVD was not really part of the show and they were advertising a big surprise is going to be happening on this show and pretty much everyone and their mother knew it was going to be RVD but they tried their best to say otherwise here. Then after all that Jerry ends his promo in a very peculiar way. Because I am Jerry <laughs> He did this like low metal scream for his last name in the promo and immediately when I heard that I flashed back to Judgment Day 2001 when he was the light heavyweight champion in the WWF and he was there doing a live shot from WWF New York and he was cutting a promo and he wraps it up by doing the exact same thing where he goes, if I was there, I'd give a whole new meaning to the words Judgment Day. I'm like, whoa, that was weird enough then. And then when I hear this promo for the very first time, I'm like, oh my God, was this his thing? Was that how he just wrapped up promos doing like this low scream on the last syllable of his promos? Did that get over? Like, was that his thing and people like resonated with it? No, that's insane. If you did that today, you look like a goof. Who would do that? Why would that get over? That's a terrible thing to do in your promos. You sound nuts. So after all that, after five minutes of highlight reel, after Joey Styles and Joel Gertner, after this big beat down on Matthews in York and Cyrus coming in to make the pinfall, Jerry Lynn's promo, go Jerry Lynn. Then we finally get the ECW intro with the, uh, the traditional ECW theme and that whole damn song. That's a very long, sequence. People think my intro is self-indulgent and long on my Thursday videos. No. ECW is the definition of indulgence, which now I think about it is a really awesome nickname for a wrestler. Somebody take that. The first real match of the evening is for the ECW Tag Team titles as Danny Doring and the Amish Roadkill defending against Hot Commodity, the team of Julio De Niro and Easy Money. Of course, Easy Money is a noted tights maker. He has a website where he makes tights for people. He's clearly showing off his skill as a tailor with this ridiculous outfit. Also, this Julio, this Julio. Julio De Niro, of course, is the former Julio Fantastico who made his pay-per-view debut at Heroes of Wrestling at Casino Magic in 1999. I think ECW is a step up for him, for that, for that Julio. Uh, they're accompanied by Chris Hamrick and Electra. Ham I had to do some research on who these two people were. Hamrick is a longtime indie wrestler. He started working for ECW in 2000. Even though he started wrestling in the mid-80s, he would wind up appearing in Wrestling Society X in their pilot episode. He was in TNA under a mask as Crimson Dragon. He even showed up as a jobber in the WWF in the mid 90s and then later years later as a fake Triple H in a skit with Booker T when he was King Booker. Electra trained by the fabulous Mula and Johnny Rods. She debuted as the valet for Dorian Roadkill but then turned on them and she debuted in late 99 but turned on Dorian Roadkill at Living Dangerously 2000. So she's been kind of a thorn in their side for a very long time up at this point. Almost a whole year. And of course the crowd chanting she's a crack whore for Electra. This is the stuff that you know this is the original ECW folks condensed right here on this show. I think I brought this up in my review for ECW Barely Legal about how like in ECW like every wrestler had every move named after them in some kind of way or some kind of pun. Uh, Denny Doring is no exception. Uh, literally all of his moves are named after something dirty. There's the panty drop elbow, the G spot sweet, the bear back. Like everything is some kind of innuendo. By the way, this match is actually really fun to watch. It's very high spotty. It's pretty much just all high spots, high spots, high spots. Uh, one of my favorites is kind of a subtle one, but I think it's very impressive uh, athletic ability. Easy money is on the outside, whipped into the barricade. He counters, but it's jumping on the top of the barricade and doing a landing onto Roadkill on the other side. Very impressive. The hot tag sees Roadkill and Easy Money getting tagged in. Roadkill with a big old hot tag, including the biggest wedgie of all time. Like cartoon level brought to life in human form with how much he was pulling back that G-string. It was insane. Electra distracts Roadkill. De Niro hits the jalapeno popper, although he actually kind of whiffs it as the camera does catch it. It's kind of a bad angle. And the crowd catches it too with the you fucked up chant. Not the, not the only time we'll be hearing that chant on this evening. 
ring. Uh, Hammer gets back in the ring, accidentally hits Money, and then uh, again, when he gets hit to the outside, a boogie bag to Disulio, a double team move there, and the champions retain. I'm going to give this match two and a half stars. It is a spotty spot spot fest by both these teams, uh, but it is very exciting to watch. Uh, as someone who is pretty unfamiliar with a lot of ECW stuff, especially the last year, year and a half or so, I don't know how often these guys wrestled each other, but I do know, I've seen like some stuff from Danny Dorian Roadkill in the past, and this match was, you know, it was fun to watch. Uh, after the match, the heels are, are beating down uh, the faces. Then Nova, the future Simon Dean, comes out to make the save with the worst dub theme of all time. I don't even know what his original theme was, but it had to have been better than what the hell they were playing here. Whose music is that? And apparently we have a match right now as Nova goes one-on-one -on -one with Confederate Currency Chris Hamrick. I guess both tag teams in the earlier matches went back to the curtain, looked at the monitor, saw they were wrestling, and go, huh, our guys are back there having a match. Should we go out and do something? No, let's let them, let them do their thing. So this is Nova's big return to ECW. He took some time off and now he's kind of rebranded as his new character. Joey Styles is really putting character change over. It's like, he's not going to be anyone's stepping stone. He's not going to be anyone's victim. He's not the goofy guy he was in the Blue World Order. He's definitely a lot more serious now. I'm curious to know what brought on this character change. So he's having to deal with Electra constantly distracting him in this matchup. Oh, look, she sticks her tongue out. What a heel. What a Jezebel. I have no idea idea. I've never seen Chris Hamrick's work before this. I don't know who he is, but he's pretty good in this match. I love his giant top rope Hurricane Rana in the middle of the match. Although I do love the spot where he's on the apron going to clothesline uh, Nova, but Nova ducks. And he takes the longest time to go, huh, where did Nova go? Which way did he go? Finally, where he turns around and gets hit by Nova. And now here's where things totally go off the rails because Electra gets in the ring. Nova kicks her in the arm. She sells it like, she, like it was broken. Nova has the cross face chicken wing on Hamrick and he's down on his back at the same time. The referee is down. Chris Chetty, who was teaming with Nova for a long time, but then they had a bitter breakup, and actually Nova beat Chetty in a loser leaves ECW match not that long ago. It didn't take long for him to come back here. He comes in wearing a referee's shirt. He does a fast count on Nova's shoulders while the other referee gets up and calls for the submission. So we have this confusing finish, supposedly. Uh, and so now, as that's happening, in comes not Polly Dangerously, but Louie Dangerously. Sign Guy Dudley has changed gimmicks, and I guess he's just filling in for Heyman because he's been a ghost in ECW for the last couple of months. He decks the uh, legit referee with his, mega, his giant phone, and then for some reason, Spike Dudley just comes in. Apropos of nothing, to badly dubbed music that sounds vaguely like Highway to Hell. So the former Sign Guy begins cutting a promo, but barely gets the words out before Chetty starts beating up Nova and Spike some more. Spike does hit the acid drop onto Chetty off of Louie Dangerously. He climbs up him uh, as he's going up there, which is pretty impressive. Nova hits Hamrick with the Kryptonite Crunch to win because like Spike is like counting the three and the other referees getting up. So like, okay, you got it. I'm gonna ring the bell for you. What the hell was the match still going on? Like I thought we had the the dirty count at the end with Chetty, but no, the match is apparently still going on. I don't know what the hell's going on. Uh, I'm gonna give this match. One and a half stars is probably the best one I can give it. It had a lot of like good moments, and then the finishes was totally balls to the wall insane. Uh, the, the, the overbooking of this whole thing, because if you think about from the beginning what you had, you had the ECW tag title match with Hot Commodity versus Dorian Roadkill that bled into Nova coming out, wrestling Hambrick, Electra's still there interfering. Then you get Chris Chetty, Louis Dangerously, and Spike Dudley all thrown into this weird-ass gumbo, and then we end with Nova winning this match that was impromptu. Uh, that really took away from a lot that was going on just in this match alone. But I am impressed from seeing Nova and I am impressed from seeing Hamrick. Again, as someone who's never seen Hamrick's work really, uh, that I was very impressed. After a killer promo by ECW champion Steve Carino, who does a pretty good job retelling his whole story arc since arriving in ECW back in 99, we then go to an I Quit match between Tommy Dreamer and C.W. Anderson. Dreamer is like the de facto head of the company in the wake of Heyman's absence because Heyman is like pretty much gone for a while. He's like looking for TV deals. He's like, he knows that bankruptcy is coming. Again, I'll get to the details of that in a little bit later on, but no, Dreamer is the one kind of running the ship at this point. It's a, it's a young versus old rivalry here in this matchup culminating in this I Quit match. My favorite part in the beginning is when the uh, ring announcer is doing the introductions and then Anderson and Dreamer just lock up and start fighting and the ring announcer tries to get Dreamer's name out. It's like, the Innovator of Violence! Yeah, good New York! They're not gonna wait! The Innovator of Violence!
You can tell this match is going to be pure hardcore madness as Dreamer suplexes CW on the floor in the first 90 seconds or so. They're trading submissions back and forth for about a minute in the ring before we go back to the outside. Uh, Dreamer bracing CW's arm between a chair and the turnbuckle post. Hits it with another chair. He blasts the ring bell right up against CW's head. That looked pretty hard. I, I wouldn't have taken that. I wouldn't want to take that. CW with a drop toe hold onto the edge of the chair in the ring. That looked brutal and Dreamer is bleeding profusely as he is wont to do. He, he, lit, he literally sacrificed like all the blood and sweat and tears for ECW. Dreamer is able to recover. He opens up a Christmas present in January and reveals a length of razor wire. At that point, C.W. Anderson starts beating up Towel Boy. I look up who Towel Boy was. Apparently, he was a kid on the ring crew who developed kind of a cult following because in between all the matches when he'd wipe down the ropes and wipe the blood off the mats and stuff, the fans would start cheering for him. So he got kind of over just by doing his job. He was part of the ring crew and cleaning up the ring and stuff. So uh, in December at their previous pay-per-view, CW, he was involved in altercation with CW Anderson in that match with Tommy Dreamer then uh, in the Massacre on 34th Street pay-per-view. CW hits a hanging superplex to the towel boy. That was kind of a ridiculous spot there. Anderson brings out a table and puts it in the ring. They go to the top rope and Dreamer catches him, hits him with the Spicoli driver, the Death Valley driver, through the table. Then Dreamer uses the plastic liner around the table and pulls it across CW's eyes to get uh, CW to say he quits. Dreamer wins. I'm going to give this match three stars. This was a very good hardcore match. Certainly a lot of innovation when using the weapons that they used in this match. Uh, towel boy was an interesting interlude. I looked him up and realize he's still, uh, if he's not currently wrestling, he was wrestling for a very long time. He's only a couple years older than I am, but he has wrestled for like Ring of Honor and CZW and stuff like that in the years since uh, ECW went under. So that was kind of a nice little entry point for him. His foot in the door basically was being a ring crew guy for ECW, getting over for cleaning the ring, and then he gets a gig as a wrestler, so you can't really beat that. So up next is the wildest promo of the night. We go backstage to see Francine trying to fit a whole salami sub sandwich in her mouth. Get it? Oral sex. Steve Carino walks in and they have a chat where he kind of doubles down on the double entendre. He wants to know where Justin Credible is and she's, oh, she, he's with Missy Hyatt and Carino says, oh, bullshit. And he walks off and out comes Justin Credible out of the bathroom with Missy Hyatt. How neither party hurt each other in this exchange. I don't know, the, the locker room is only like 10 feet by 10 feet. How did you not hear each other? They walk out. So apparently he, apparently Credible and Francine had this agreement where, you know, Francine's not going to give any of this to Justin Credible if, uh, as long as he doesn't have the goal. Incredible was a former world champion, but now he's not. So uh, a lot of a lot of is at stake for Justin here. And then the whole promo ends when uh, Carino and Jack Victory are stunned that Missy is actually there. And then Jack Victory actually makes a reference to when Missy managed him several years ago. So that's why we got the title for all you want. We be talking you. And then the promo ends with Carino and Victory breaking the fourth wall and saying, "Hi, Spot. We stole the promo again." Like. Okay, man, you do you. I'm sure that is a hysterical line for you. I don't get the reference, but yeah, from beginning to end, this whole promo was just like, wow, this is very risque. It's just, it's crazy like, because we I'm so used to watching WWE and the PG product today. Like going back to this time period is like it's it's cool, but at the same time, it's like, whoa, here's all this stuff you would never see, <laughs> never see today. We then get a three-way dance for the number one contendership for the Tag Team Championships as the FBI, Little Guido and Tony Mamaluke, take on the unholy alliance of Tajiri and Mikey Whipwreck, the man who convinced a whole generation of wrestlers that it was okay to dress like that, taking on Kid Cash and Super Crazy. Uh, there's a big You Fucked Up chant earlier in the match after Kid Cash, well, fucks up when he's doing a spot with Mikey Whipwreck. We do briefly revisit the classic bout between Tajiri and Super Crazy. That whole feud between those two really put the two on the map in America. You thank ECW for that. That happening. A very fast paced match where everyone's getting their shit in. At one point, all six men are in the ring. Everyone's submission now! And uh, credit to Kid Cash, by the way, in this match because he's bouncing all over the place while he's there. As friend of the show, Sin Min distracts the referee. Big man, Sal Graziano from the FBI does a splash on the Kid Cash. That must not have felt good. Uh, Mama Luke covers, and Cash and Crazy are eliminated. We are down to the final two teams. Tajiri and Whipwreck each drop their opponents face first into some chairs in the corner. That's how you do that spot. You don't do it on the edge on the back like Tommy Dreamer did. 
Take it from these guys. Whipwreck, the former ECW champion, is on the corner trying to fight off both of his opponents. He tries to do a double whipper snapper, but the FBI blocks it and turns into a double Fujiwara armbar. Tajiri does make the save with the green mist in Amamaluke's eyes. Double dragon suplex onto the FBI by Tajiri and Whipwreck. The Unholy Alliance win the day, but unfortunately will not be able to challenge for those tag titles anytime soon. I give this match two and a half stars out of four. Very, uh, I enjoy the pacing in this matchup as it goes from fast pace and frenetic at the beginning with all three teams down to a slower, more methodical pace, more hard-hitting pace with the uh, two teams that are left, the Unholy Alliance and the FBI. And this is more of an emblematic thing with all of ECW, but it especially kind of like uh, glared at me in this match. Just kind of an overall lack of psychology, just like big spot, big spot, big spot. I felt that there was uh, slightly more storytelling and slightly more of a uh, dramatic tale being told, even in the uh, tag title match from earlier. I think this is a match coming up because there are two little dots on the network timeline that tell you that, and there's a basic structure sure here that makes it look like a match but uh, we'll you'll see what I mean in a second it's Johnny Swinger and Simon Diamond with Don Marie starting out in the ring Swinger says that Diamond has been hogging Don Marie in bed so he's leaving Don Marie's specific management and it's gonna be even though he's still teaming with Simon Diamond and still who's still with Don Marie he's gonna bring on his own management of Blue Boy Management which is an obvious ripoff on Bad Boy Management which is run by Sean Combs out comes the Blue Meanie or the Blue Boys he's called here and wow Wow, look at the blue mini here. He has shed a whole bunch of weight. He would gain it all back later, but just this weird, miraculous moment here where blue mini uh, got really trimmed down and really cut. He was dating porn star Jasmine St. Clair somehow. And so, but the whole, my whole thought when he was first coming out and Swinger was like, I'm signing out with blue boy management because I'm not getting enough sex from Don Marie. I'm like, so you're going to get sex from blue mini? No, no, you're going to have sex with Jasmine St. Clair apparently. Anyway, these two are ostensibly taking on Balls Mahoney and Chili Willie. That was kind of an insane setup to that. Uh, the match is pretty much starts from like a giant high spot right at the beginning a problem solver on the chili willy by swinger and diamond meanie gets into the ring for no reason why would he get in there his guys are winning he gets hit in the head with a chair by balls mahoney out comes rhino the television champion the hired gun of the network he gores everybody he gores don marie he gores chili willy he gores blue meanie and he gives a pile driver to jasmine st Clair off the ropes which is always an insane looking spot and it just ends uh, there's a pile of bodies and rhino walks away i give this one a half star because very much like in the opening match that we had wasn't much of a match and this one didn't have a finish a triple threat ladder match with the ECW Championship up next as the King of Old School, Steve Carino, defends his title against the Sandman and Just Incredible. If you want to not be hyped up about the Sandman, then just watch one of his matches on the network because apparently can't show its entrance worth a damn. Like, they just don't have the entrances at all in this match up here. It's like halfway through Sandman's thing, and then the match officially begins. Some backstory to this. Uh, Credible is a former ECW champion, but he lost a title to Carino back in November. But then, about a month or so prior to this show, Carino had the physical belt stolen from him by the Sandman and so now the belt's being suspended above the ring and these three are going to be wrestling for it. Coincidentally it was a triple threat match between these three guys that allowed Carino to win the title from Credible in the first place so kind of tying back to that. Uh, this match is basically how many times can we have Sandman fall off the ladder. That was essentially all there is in this match. Carino hits Sandman with a cane to knock him off the ladder. The ladder tips over bonking Carino in the head on accident. I feel worse for the unplanned ladder contact like that than I do for the planned ladder spots. Credible tosses Sandman to the outside and through a table and some chairs on top of the table. Like how many weird ways can we get Sandman to get totally fucked up and throw him through all these different uh, things? He does get some time to shine after this though. He suplexes Carino into a leaning ladder, throws Credible to the outside and through another table. Sandman tries climbing the ladder super fast, but these are not your sturdy ladders you see in WWE today. These are like, you know, janky, wobbly ladders. He just climbs up right away and like he falls over. He falls off and lands on the ladder and breaks it. You just see it bend in half. Uh, Credible is obviously planning for something because he's on the top rope, but he didn't get to do it, which that was hilarious. Uh, later, Carino and Credible dump Sandman off the ladder to the outside through a table. Big shock. It looks safer somehow than the way Sandman fell off that ladder before. Uh, Credible with the That's Incredible on Carino. Francine hits the Coochie Con Rana on the outside. I didn't even know she did that. Uh, they bring in a giant ladder, and then the belt goes up a couple of feet. And I was wondering about that because Joey Styles played it off like who's the puppet master who's controlling the belt i was wondering like is this supposed to be a reference like is is some puppet master at play moving the belt around like a la you know king of the ring 99 with steve austin versus the mcmahons or is this just them moving the belt up a little higher because the ladder is now taller than where the belt is i don't know it was never fully explained credible drives carino off the ladder onto a table i feel like uh, credible got a lot of that landing more than
more than Carino did. I feel like Carino will hurt more from that. Sandman climbs a giant ladder to grab the championship and is now a four-time ECW World Champion. I'm going to give this one two stars out of four. Like I said, this is basically one spot done over and over again. How many times can you get someone to fall off a ladder through a table, namely Sandman? Carino Incredible got their licks into, but it was mostly Sandman who got punished here. Uh, but Carino Incredible, they show respect to Sandman after the match. They all shake hands, but then the Baldies run back in and beat them up out of the arena. Rhino comes in, slips a chair next to him, almost fucks this whole thing up, but he recovers and gores uh, the Sandman. He gets on the microphone, but that would have been dreadful, because you see him rearing up for it. And then like, he goes, whoop, right away. First step, he almost fucks it up. So he's able to recover. So good for him. He gets on the microphone. He complains. He's a TV champion in a company that has no TV deal. He threatens to kill Sandman's family if Sandman does not grant him a title shot right then and there. Holy shit. How often do you hear that kind of threat being lobbed in wrestling today? Sandman responds in the affirmative. Ring the fucking bell. And so we get the ECW Championship defender right away, Sandman against Rhino. Rhino hits a gore and a pile driver on, a, on the onto the floor through a table. Back in the ring, Sandman somehow kicks out. What? One more pile driver in the ring. Rhino wins and becomes a dual champion. He is the company's final world and television champion. I'm gonna give him one a half star because again, it was just you know such a quick match. I can't believe Sandman kicked out out of the pile driver off the apron through a table on the floor. That's ridiculous. So the extra one was just kind of a bonus, basically. Cyrus challenges anyone to face off of Rhino right now. Rob Van Dam, the not surprise, surprise comes out. The person they said who would not show up actually did. What a shock. So RVD making his first appearance in ECW in several months now. The surprise guest, he wants to challenge Rhino for the title, but then Jerry Lynn interrupts, and Mr. I Will Only Wrestle in the main event has his main event match right here and now against RVD. How very ECW that RVD would be in the main event in the final pay-per-view of the company's existence, but doesn't get a challenge for the world championship. Of course, these two had a classic rivalry in ECW a couple years before this that was considered one of their finest, one of the best rivalries in late 90s wrestling, it was RVD and Jerry Lynn. That rivalry especially made Jerry Lynn more so than RVD, but really made both of them kind of household names. As I'm going on, I'm watching this, I'm really, it's a great match by most standards, but unfortunately, does not quite live up to what these guys did in 99, unfortunately. If you watch like that stuff from then and then watch it now, it's like something is off here, unfortunately. RVD goes for a rolling monkey flip, but JL catches him with a big forearm. An asshole chant emerges, and Joey Styles on commentary thinks are talking about Lynn or Cyrus, but it sounds more they're chanting at the bald fan who was trying to get all in the guy's business when they were fighting in his corner. It, that's what led to the hit the bald guy chant from a, a, about a minute earlier. We get another you fucked up chant from the crowd. This time when Lynn kind of messes up the schoolboy pin on RVD, that is a chant I am not sad to see gone today for the most part. Like I'm sure it exists in some pockets of wrestling. But you know, like, yeah, as someone who's been in the ring, like if I, you know, I screwed up plenty when I wrestled, but the last thing I would have wanted is for the fans to also chant you fucked up at me. Like that's the last thing I would have needed. And you know, I, you know, from a fan perspective, I could see that being kind of a fun thing to join in and be a part of the show in that way. But as, as, as that does to me, it's it just in general on both sides. I think, yeah, that, that, that chant's not very nice. RVD goes for a rolling thunder kind of move again onto a chair, but Lynn gets out of the way, does a crazy flippy-dippy sunset flip powerbomb to RVD off the corner. Back of his head hits the chair, which must have hurt. He spikes RVD with a big DDT. Cyrus gets into the ring to do more damage, but out comes Joel Gertner, whose head is all taped up from the beginning of the show. It looks kind of ridiculous. Looks like he's wearing a weird hat. And he DDTs Cyrus to a huge pop. RVD hits Lynn with the Van Daminator. I mean, Jerry, how often did you fight RVD over the years? You know not to hold a chair when you're around Rob Van Dam. But now here's the thing. Who's going to hit, who's going to help Rob with the Van Terminator? There's no Bill Alfonso there. So who's going to hold up the chair for RVD? Why, Joel Gertner, of course. He'll help out. It's the move that Shane McMahon would invent three months later at WrestleMania 17. The Van Terminator, right into the mush of Jerry Lynn. RVD wins the match. I'm going to give this one three stars out of four. It was very fitting way to end the last pay-per-view of ECW. A little botchy at times. I think that just kind of comes to the territory of an RVD match. Sometimes you can get a little out of hand. Uh, it's a send-off that ECW deserves. Again, not to the caliber of what we saw from RVD and Lynn in their prime of the rivalry, but this is still a very good match and probably 
objectively of one of the better matches of the entire show. We do get one final backstage segment to close out the pay-per-view where Justin Credible and Steve Carino announce the formation of the new Impact Players. Boy, that word new just guarantees success, doesn't it, in wrestling? They do the classic Impact Players pose and the show closes out. Unfortunately, we never got to see what they would do as a tag team, but even if ECW didn't close just weeks after this event, uh, we wouldn't know anyway because both guys were out of the company by February. Literally the day after this show, Steve Carino left the company because he wasn't getting paid. And so he signed a contract with WCW because of his close ties with Dusty Rhodes, because of those two feuded for a while in ECW before this. So he gets signed to WCW. He's supposed to debut at the Sin pay-per-view, apparently, uh, two months or so before WCW officially closes, but that debut never happens. So he's under contract, never on TV in WCW. When the World Wrestling Federation buys out WCW, they don't, they, they release him from his contract. So Carino, he, he would come back years later as a trainer or as kind of a guest trainer for the Performance Center, uh, but no, he would never got a chance to actually wrestle for the WWF. And meanwhile, Justin Credible would return to the Federation in February of that year, teaming up with X-Pac uh, and forming X-Factor and all that stuff. So he wasn't long for ECW. He did not stick around for the end of ECW either. My final grade for ECW's Guilty as Charged 2001 is going to be a C-plus grade. Uh, this is just a wild car crash of a show full of impromptu matchups, crazy pre- and post-match beatdowns, and a lot of high spots and not a ton of psychology. Uh, there were a few matches that delivered. Uh, the I Quit match with the Dreamer and Anderson, RVD and Jerry Lynn, both of the tag matches that actually went somewhere, the tag title match and the triangle, uh, the, the uh, three-way dance, those were fine. But then, like, there was the opening match with, like, Cyrus and Jerry Lynn, Lynn and Matthews in York. Uh, Nova and Hamrick was kind of a clusterfuck near the end. They kind of took me out of it. Just too much car crash booking overall in this show. And I've said before that it's nice to have some unpredictability when you have a wrestling show. The kind of feeling that anything can happen. But there is, I think, to, you do that to an extent. And then beyond that, like we had in this show, it just looks like things are being booked on the fly as the show is going on and it leaves you just kind of confused. Wait, what's happening? What's going on? And so yeah, unpredictability can be a good thing. I've said for a long time that's the one thing that WWE could use right now in their booking. But yeah, when you have a show like this, the complete opposite end of the spectrum, to me, it's a little too much of that. And this is not going to count toward the overall grade of the show because it's not really fair, but my personal grudge with this show was just the network editing and how badly they messed up a lot of the crowd reactions and sounds with all those network dubs and all the stuff they could Obviously, they couldn't play a lot of that music because it was, you know, licensed and copyright. They didn't have the copyright to that. So, yeah, I get why it's dubbed in the network. But really, if you just look at one of the biggest examples of how that messes things up is when you see the audience react to RVD's music being played, uh, Walk by Pantera, you see them explode. But the audience noise is so muted and meh, like it does not capture that feeling at all. And that pissed me off watching. That was something that was persistent throughout the entire show. So mere weeks after this, ECW in February would cancel their March pay-per-view Living Dangerously, and then in April of 2001, ECW would officially close their doors and declare bankruptcy. About a week or a week and a half before that, though, Paul Heyman would show up on WWF TV, on Raw's War, doing color commentary alongside Jim Ross in place of Jerry Lawler. So that's when a lot of ECW people realized the writing was on the wall and the company was going under. Apparently, one of the reasons Heyman apparently has stayed quiet and was a ghost for so long at the end of ECW was because he was, had stayed quiet about the bankruptcy because he wanted to make sure his guys got paid and that their checks weren't recalled by creditors after that 90-day period. That's why he stayed quiet. According to him, I don't think every wrestler got that treatment, but but that was his story. ECW owed nearly $9 million in unpaid bills for things like salaries, TV deals, merchandise. It balances out to more like $7 million when you factor in the money that in-demand pay-per-view technically owed ECW, but they wouldn't pay them because they knew they were going out of business. So yeah, they owed at least $500,000 to almost 40 workers, including, and these are the numbers I looked up, $150,000 for RVD, $100,000 for Dreamer, $50,000 for Joey Styles, $50,000 for Rhino, and so on and so forth. How some of these people People either stuck around like Rhino and Styles and Dreamer or came back like RVD. How they did that is mind boggling to me. According to the bankruptcy filings, they also owed almost $600,000 to WWE, so it wasn't some benevolent gift that the Federation had given ECW in the 90s. It was, it was more kind of like a loan, basically. It was a debt. But Heyman did get the last laugh because he basically tricked the company into paying off his debts in bankruptcy court, so I think Heyman turned out okay as a result of that. But yeah, that was ECW. Too small to be big, too big to be small. The show ends not with a bang, not with a whimper necessarily, but definitely just like a wild show that was very 
emblematic of what ECW was about. There was some good, but there was also just kind of some, eh, just some stuff that was forgettable. Well, that's going to do it for my review of Guilty as Charged 2001. Thanks once again to Jeffrey Pridemore on Patreon for nominating this show for me to review. If you want to play a role in determining what classic shows I review in the future, be they good, bad, or somewhere in between, go to patreon.com slash wrestlingwithregret, become a $10 backer or above, and you'll have the chance to nominate shows for me to review in the future. Next time on the Classic Pay-Per-View Review, well, folks, it's money in the bank season, as they say. We're getting closer to that big show happening in a few weeks in Chicago, so I figure it's only fitting to finally review easily, unquestionably, my most nominated pay-per-view since I began this whole segment. It's Money in the Bank 2011. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.